Welcome back to Closing Arguments. I'm Ted Rollins. In tonight for Vinnie Politan, we begin this hour out in Monterey County, California, where the Kristen Smart murder trial continues. Defendant Paul Flores and his father, Ruben, are facing trial together. They have separate juries. Paul has long been suspected in the 1996 disappearance and death of Kristen Smart, but he wasn't charged until April of last year. But during the over two decades between Kristen's disappearance and Paul's arrest, he had many different run-ins with the law, including being accused of rape by three different women, accusations that Paul's jury are going to hear about during this murder trial, and that process started today. Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter has the details. It's been nearly 30 years since Kristen Smart went missing. She was declared legally dead in 2002. Her body never found. The last person seen with her was Paul Flores. Prosecutors allege he killed Smart while trying to rape her in his dorm room. Did you attend a party uh, at or near the Cal Poly campus in May of 1996? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. While police suspected Paul Flores in Smart's disappearance, there wasn't enough evidence to charge him, and the case went cold. Years later, Flores moved south to Los Angeles, where, again, he came under the scrutiny of law enforcement. In L.A.'s Redondo Beach, Flores was being investigated for rape and was a suspect in two more cases of sexual assault. In the Redondo Beach case, the L.A. Times reported that in 2007, a woman had gone out with friends and had some drinks. She told police that after drinks, she awoke in a stranger's bed, naked and wrapped in a blanket. She had no memory of meeting the man beside her or having sex with him. According to her medical exam, there was no obvious indication of force or assaultive behavior. In 2011, four years later, the DNA sample collected from the woman's body was identified as belonging to Paul Flores. Initially, the woman, referred to as Rhonda Doe, could not identify Paul from a lineup, but now prosecutors say she is certain that it was him after seeing a photo of his driveway. In the end, Los Angeles prosecutors did not charge Flores with rape. After decades of suspicion, Paul Flores was arrested last April for Smart's murder. And during a press conference announcing his arrest, San Luis Obispo County Sheriff Ian Parkinson told reporters that investigators had discovered something of value in renewed searches of the homes that linked Flores to Smart's death. Detectives served search warrants at the home of Paul Flores, as well as his sister, mother, and father, all simultaneously. During the search warrant, detectives recovered evidence related to the murder of Kristen Smart. Flores was charged with murder, while his father, Ruben Flores, was charged with accessory to murder. Both pleaded not guilty. Two months later, prosecutors sought to amend the original complaint in the murder of Smart to reflect the two Los Angeles rape charges. Local station KEYT had this report from the hearing. Prosecutor Chris Prevell uh, argued the motion filed by the DA's office looking to add two rape charges that he says took place in Los Angeles County in 2011 and 2017. But the judge hearing the motion to include those additional counts ruled against the prosecution. Judge Craig Van Royen uh, made his ruling denying the motion to amend the charges saying they could inflame the jury and potentially uh, affect the outcome of the case. While the charges of rape won't be considered by a jury, evidence of Paul's alleged sexual misconduct will. California law allows prosecutors to admit such evidence to show his predisposition to commit sexual assaults. Three women, including the woman in the Redondo Beach case, are expected to testify Paul Flores drugged and raped them. Prosecutors hope to convince a jury that Paul attempted to do the same. To Kristen Smart. And joining us in studio, Court TV's Chanley Painter, who uh, was out in Monterey County, uh, California, for the beginning of this trial. You've been in the courtroom, seen uh, all, all of the players. 
Uh, one of those Jane Doe's testifies today, big day. Uh, what can mm -hmm. you tell us about the testimony? Yeah, the first of three potential Jane Doe's the judge is allowing in took the stand today. That was Rhonda Doe. And she said that she met Paul Flores at a bar in Redondo Beach in January of 2008. She and some friends were about to leave the bar uh, after that night out. But Paul actually rode up on his bicycle and she agreed to briefly go to his house before the two rejoined her friends. So she testified that once they got to Paul's house, he gave her some water and that's when she blacked out. She testified that when she woke up, Paul was having non-consensual sex with her. She says she only remembers brief moments of the encounter while she was in and out of consciousness. She later remembers waking up crying beside his bed and asking him to take her home, which he did. Now the prosecutor, Deputy District Attorney Chris Purvill, asked Rhonda Doe why she didn't report this incident at the time, and she said that she didn't think it would be prosecuted and didn't, quote, see the point. But she did call authorities in 2021 after seeing the news of the report of Paul's arrest in the Kristen Smart case. She says she initially felt like she couldn't breathe when she recognized the photo of Paul as the one arrested for this. So she called in and reported it. Now, during her cross-examination, Paul's attorney, of course, Robert Singer, asked Rhonda Doe why she didn't tell investigators that she attended Cal Poly at the time that Kristen went missing. She was a student at the university in 1995-96 and part of the following year, she said she did tell investigators back in 1996. She only knew Kristen went missing, but didn't know anything about Paul, the person of interest. So uh, he was also asked if she, she, he also asked if she was able to identify the photo lineup of Paul uh, with certainty. And uh, she did identify Paul, but she admitted it. She wasn't really sure at the time that it was him. So the defense trying to poke some holes in her memory, Ted. Yeah, it's so bizarre that she went to Cal Poly yeah. too at the, at the same world. time, yes. Yeah bizarre. Um, jurors, we've, we've got a lot of trials where jurors get to ask questions. What'd they ask? Yeah, that's a, un a unique aspect of this case is that the jurors actually submit questions and then the judge approves them and then they ask the witness the questions. Well, the jurors wanted to know what the uh, two, Paul and this Jane Doe, talked about while they walked from the bar to his house and what his demeanor was at the time. And so she answered and said she didn't think that they had too much in common and talked about a Lakers game she attended. She described him as polite and acting normally for that juror's question. Uh, now, Ruben's attorney, uh, Harold Misick, he didn't ask any questions of this witness, obviously. Mm -hmm. This was um, someone about Paul Flores. And then the day wrapped up with the DA and investigator who questioned and interviewed Rhonda Doe after she came forward and uh, showed several pictures of Paul's house at that time and that bar that she said that she met him at. This is just one of three that the judge is allowing to come into court. It was a big decision made. The prosecution obviously very happy of it, but uh, two more Jane Doe's similar stories are we going to hear? That is. So the judge did allow three women who tell a similar story. They claim that they were raped and uh, after being drugged by Paul Flores. And so we're going to hear from two more. So uh, Rachel Doe is another one that the judge will allow in. She will say she encountered Paul in 2007. Of course, Rhonda Doe encountered Paul in 2008. And then Sarah Doe will also claim that she encountered him at a bar and that she was also drugged and he was aggressive and for, forced a gag in her mouth. Just some really graphic testimony. And it's all a part of you know the rules of evidence in California, Rule 1108, where he's charged with murder while in commission of a rape that allows the prosecutors to bring in this type of testimony, this MO of what they say he allegedly did to Kristen Smart. Yeah, it, a big ruling uh, in the prosecution's favor yes. because these types of witnesses can absolutely change the game. Shanley Painter, thank you for the update. Let's bring in the think tank. They'll know stuff to talk about. In Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney at Mercy in Los Angeles, California, the former prosecutor and author of the new book, Harvard, the hashtag, my journey from Big Law. Ackland's got a copy of it. Big Law and business owner, Nima Romani, and in Phoenix, Arizona, the attorney who represented Jody Arias and also authored Trapped with Ms. Arias. That's Kirk Nermy. Ackland, when are you going to write a book? Yeah, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> the, Give me time. <laughs> uh, this case is, um, and this ruling for the judge to allow uh, these other women to come in is a real game changer. Uh, and 
I get how you get there because he's accused of this, you know, murder during the commission of rape. But where's the evidence of a rape? I mean, uh, to get there, your thoughts on on the fact that these women are coming and telling these uh, uh, stories to the jury? I, I have a big problem with it because they're not they're not consistent with what they believe happened to um, Ms. Smart. We have, you know, yes, we have um, signs of rape, but there's no murder. And for the prosecution to think that in his opening, in their opening statement, to lay out these facts where we have no evidence at all and we don't even have a body is a problem. The evidence that they're presenting, yes, he, he it looks like that person, it, it it leads to the rape charges for the um, the current victims, but it doesn't lead to uh, it doesn't lead to like a murder charge. They need more. Yeah, Nima, you think, boy, the, the, he should be on trial for date uh, or for drugging these women. There seems to be some evidence of that. Your thoughts? You're out there in California, former prosecutor. Uh, did the judge make the right decision to allow these three to enter into this trial? The judge did, Ted, and California law is very prosecution friendly when it comes to these cases, and Chanley nailed it. It's Penal Code Section 1108. Normally, Law School 101, you don't get propensity evidences, but California law does allow it when you're talking about a rape and there's other potential sexual assaults. And what we heard today was very graphic. You know, the alleged victim was drugged, you know, when she walked into his house. She asked for a cup of water. Next thing you know, she's being sexually assaulted. So it's a tough case with respect to smart, but the jurors are not going to like Paul when one victim after another comes and testifies. And that cumulative evidence is going to be very hard to overcome if you're the defense here. Kirk, your thoughts on uh, today, just round one of three of these similar stories in, in front of this jury. Uh, how much of a game changer could it be for the state? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Neiman to a certain extent in that the fact that this evidence will, in fact, lead to a conviction. I mean, you have three Jane Doe's come in and say that they were sexually assaulted and this fits a pattern. The problem is the conviction really, the way I see it is, and this is where I agree with Eklund a bit too, is that it's going to be based not on the evidence that he attacked Miss Smart, because there is no evidence that he sexually assaulted Miss Smart, and there's nothing connecting him to the murder. The conviction is going to be based on improper inferences that he did what the state believes he did based on what he did to other women. And that, to me, is the big problem here, and that's where I think the judge made the mistake. Had there been evidence that Miss Smart was sexually assaulted, I think the evidence would be clearly be admissible. But there's no evidence to back up that correlation, and that's where I think the judge's decision falls apart. It will lead to a conviction. Yes, but it'll be certainly be probably an issue number one on appeal. Absolutely, it'll be uh, interesting to see. But you just have to think that the jury, <laughs> to, to all your points, hates him, uh, and then uh, will uh, by the end of the third witness telling a similar story, and um, it's not going to go well for him.